Hello, I'm Michael Tobin, a member of the Board of Directors of the Wellesley Conservation Land Trust. Welcome to the fourth in a series of educational webinars presented by the Wellesley Conservation Land Trust. This webinar is co-sponsored with the Wellesley Free Library, Sustainable Wellesley, and the Town of Wellesley's Natural Resource Commission. We thank all for their support in promoting this event. The Wellesley Conservation Land Trust is your local, private, nonprofit land trust. Founded in 1958, we have 10 sanctuaries. Five of these have trails and three are interconnecting. The Susan Lee connects with the Heil Trail along the Winding River Road, and those connect via the Aqueduct Trail to the one mile circular trail on the Guernsey property, a 25 acre sanctuary that includes beautiful Lake Sabrina in the southwest corner of Wellesley. We will be exploring skunk cabbage today in the wetlands at Guernsey, among one other place. Other properties with trails are Pickle Point on Morse's Pond and Cronk's Rocky Woodland, a spring wildflower beauty in the middle of the College Heights residential area. Please get outdoors and enjoy them all. We have four additional talks planned in the Wellesley Conservation Land Trust series and uh, that are scheduled at this time, including uh, socially or, or in addition, socially distant spring bird walks and volunteer invasive removal days are currently being planned. Please check out our website and Facebook page for additional information and like and follow the Facebook page for additional updates. This webinar is being recorded and it lasts approximately 45 minutes. A question and answer session will follow. Since you're all on mute, please enter any questions in the chat function at the bottom of the screen during the presentation or at the end, and we'll then look to address them at the end. We will send the links to the slides presented, a recording and key resources to all registrants within the next few days. Our topic this afternoon is weird and wonderful skunk cabbage, spring's first wildflower. This is being presented by fellow board member, Judy Barr. Judy has a Bachelor of Science from Simmons College and a doctorate in health policy from the Harvard University. Judy's been a professor, researcher, and administrator for 40 years at Northeastern University School of Pharmacy. Judy joined the Wellesley Conservation Land Trust Board in 2016. She's developed the Guernsey QR code trails and narratives accompanying the 72 signs along the trail. More information can be found on our website. And now, Weird and Wonderful Skunk Cabbage by Judy. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Glad that you'll be spending your uh, afternoon learning some strange things about a strange plant, these weird and wonderful skunk cabbages. Um, I am, um, for my 40 years at Northeastern, I am a PowerPoint queen, but in terms of Zoom, I'm still learning. So Michael is really giving me heavy support and I'm going to ask him a question right now. Michael, are you seeing my screen? Looking great, thank you. Okay, and let me make sure that it advances. Okay, so I became interested in skunk cabbage and I'm gonna go back to the first slide uh, because it's, it's just beautiful. I mean, look at those structures coming out of, in this case, water. The first one um, is about two weeks, uh, about a month ago. The next one uh, to the, uh, top right is what it appears about now. And the bottom left is what it's going to appear in about two more weeks. Um, I'm going to take you um, to various places in Wellesley so you can see them, February, March, uh, and then to give you an overview of what they look like in the future. So what's gonna be covered? Skunk cabbage, so we're gonna look at or, or talk about the smell. Where do you find them? Uh, it's a native wildflower. Yes, a wildflower. So you'll find out where the flowers are and also learn about what native means. Um, and then it's the earliest native spring wildflower and why and how does that happen? 
what is the life cycle of it, who, what benefits from it, and you're going to be learning some new terms as we go along the way. And if you uh, love purple and green, you're going to love this plant. Okay, first about the stinky smell. Um, some say it smells like garlic, some say skunk, hence it's called skunk. Um, others says it just smells like rotten meat, but it's beneficial to the uh, winter insects that need food, especially the ones that like rotting fish, uh, rot, rotting flesh. Um, they come flying to it because they are going to get a meal. Um, there is pollen there uh, and they're going to get a meal. And once the insects are on the plant and eating it, they carry that pollen to um, other plants and then to another skunk cabbage plant and then pollinate it. One plant cannot self-pollinate, so we need the buzz uh, carrying them around. So where is skunk cabbage? Um, it likes cold areas, so it's going to be in the northern area. It needs mucky, marshy, gloppy water. So it's uh, going to be along streams, wetlands, ri riverbeds. And in the Eastern United States is Eastern skunk cabbage, which goes from Northern Canada down to North Carolina area down here, this area. Now it's called native. And the question is, what is the native? The Department of, of Ag US Department of Agriculture defines native as only plants found in this country before the European settlement. So others that are introduced from other countries are not considered native. And the reason there's so much emphasis on native plants is the eco ecosystem has grown up around native plants, native birds, native insects, native trees, and they have an ecosystem. When you introduce a non-native plant, it throws it off kilter and they can't maximally thrive. So you're gonna hear more and more emphasis on native plants. This is a native plant. Um, there is a Western skunk cabbage and it's called the American skunk cabbage, uh, which is in the Pacific Northwest up here. Um, it is a completely different genus. It has similar characteristics where you're gonna see a lot of purple, in the Pacific Northwest, they see a lot of yellow. So it's very different. And when, if you want to find out where native or non-native or introduced are, this website that remember will have this posted so you'll be able to see it. You can go to this and plant, put in any plant name and it'll tell you whether it's native or non-native and it will show you where in the United States it's native or non-native. Now, I'm going to take you to two areas in Wellesley because we have to get into the field and see what they look like. And because we're looking for wetlands, Wellesley has an awful lot of wetlands. We have, remember how close up, up here along our border is the Charles River. So there's a lot of things coming down to the Charles. The Charles loops around, it's also down here. So all of these green areas are designated as wetlands. And so here, here they all are. So I'm first going to take you to Guernsey, which is our largest sanctuary in the um, Wellesley Conservation Land Trust. It has Lake S Sabrina, it has a stream running through it, it has a swampy area. And then later, after we go through the life cycle, I'm going to take you to the Brook Path near the high school at, at Payne Street. So you can see one right in the middle of town, which is about in here. So um, we're gonna go to Guernsey. Uh, you're going to, I'm using a handheld iPhone. Um, I'm going to give you directions on how to get there. Because if you go to Guernsey, you might not find it. You really need direct directions on how to get there. And the part that we're entering into Guernsey is in Needham. About 40% of Guernsey is in Needham. And I want you to be on the lookout because this is one of the skunk cabbages that I find. And this is what it looks like. 
So it's uh, hard to get that uh, iPhone in and even with the Zoom lens, but be on the lookout. Uh, if you don't see them at first, I'm going to come back, go through the life cycle and give it to you so you can really see them from still photographs. Okay, Michael, take it away. Take us to Guernsey. I'm at the Locust Lane entrance to Guernsey Sanctuary. Locust Lane ends in a cul-de-sac. It's in Needham. And on one side of the cul-de-sac is 130 on the left, Locust Lane. And on the right is 131 Locust Lane. There's parking in the, this area, but please respect the private properties of the owners that abut uh, the sanctuary. Right now, this is February 26th, right now there's that snowbank there. The town plows all the snow there. But by the time you come, um, it should be down. There is an easy uh, over the snowbank down into to the property. This is a part of the sanctuary, as I said, that's in Needham. About 40% about of Guernsey Sanctuary is in Needham. So enter it behind that sign, which is a no littering sign, and behind it you'll see the signpost that says Guernsey Sanctuary. If you entered Guernsey from the Locust Lane side, you'd now be standing in front of the site. Now we're going to begin our adventure in the search for skunk cabbage. We're going to turn to our right and start down the path until we get to the swamp area that will be on your left. Look for several of the signs that are along the path and stop in front of the sign that says skunk cabbage. Here is the skunk cabbage sign. Notice in the upper right is a QR code. And if you have a QR code reader on your cell phone, you'll be able to um, focus on that and learn much more about skunk cabbage. What we're going to do now is excuse the shakiness as I get up. We're going to walk down this path to this water there. And there are some skunk cabbages down there that are just starting to come up. So hold on and come with me as I go down here. See those two green areas over there? The one in the front is the engine of a skunk cabbage starting to, to come up. And here's another one in the middle of the water. Notice how it's green as well as sort of an orange, a sort of a purple tint up toward the top. And here is a happy trio of three, Papa Bear, Mama Bear, Baby Bear. And in the back is another one. Pretty soon this whole area will be filled with skunk cabbage as it's coming up. Now stay on the path, don't go walking down in it because it's all very mushy, marshy, and we don't uh, want to harm the vegetation that still will be coming up. Remember, these are the early ones. The skunk cabbage are some of the earliest things that uh, come up in the spring. And then these three, the ones I was showing you, will then keep on growing and will grow out and, and will look like cabbage leaves. Look at this. In each one of those three groups of moss is a finger sticking up and those are stuck skunk cabbage just coming out. Let me zoom in on them. See? Just a little one. In each one, there's one in the front, excuse the wind here, one back further, then one over to the far right and then another one down here on the right.
Michael, are you seeing my screen? Yep, go ahead, Judy. Okay. Okay, so you had a, um, a lesson on how to get to find them. It's a swampy area on either side um, that are going to have skunk, uh, skunk cabbage. So I'm going to give you just a fast overview now of the life cycle of it, and then we're going to come back to each one and tell you some stories about each one of these phases. This is what you were seeing. Uh, there, this, um, I've lost my, there we go. Um, this is the skunk cabbage. It's, it has uh, powerful engines that burn through the snow, and we'll come through that in just a minute. Then they get bigger and bigger, and there's a leaf bud that grows on the side of all these. This structure is really one, of, it's a modified leaf, and it grow, this one withers, this one then grows into an unfurling skunk cabbage set of leaves that look like this, sort of spiral leaves. And then they can completely cover uh, a swampy area like this in June or early July. They have very little fiber in them as they're growing. They grow so rapidly. So what's really keeping them up is, is water pressure. When it gets dry, holes form in these leaves, they turn sort of black and they just dissolve. And there's very little organic matter left on the soil um, after that. And then they go dormant until um, they come back and go through their cycle again. So this is the burning through uh, the soil. It's the, as I called it, the engine that can. Um, skunk cabbage has this amazing um, process of um, it's secret is in its roots. It has deep roots that are full of nutrients. And those nutrients then trigger heat. And the heat gets shot up to this part that's going to form a, um, the, the, the flower of it and it's a modified leaf and it's going to stay closed for a while as the heat builds up inside of that. Now remember, this is a leaf. So the plant has an, I call it an internal heat production engine and it just burns right through. And they actually can reach temperatures up to uh, 75, 80 degrees and that's contained inside there so that they're, they're nice and warm um, and the, the bugs love it. So early on, these are green peaks, the early form that are burning through. And here in late March, here are the, these, those root systems. They generate heat. It's one of the few plants that has the ability to produce heat, thermo heat, genesis, develop, produce. So it's the heat's produced by these roots down below, which then push them up through. And then these structures start uh, growing, swelling. Um, and that's when the smell starts developing. When they get warmer, some chemicals are released. There's little cracks in here and the smell then goes out and the carrion flies and gnats and things say, hmm, something smells really good for me and I come over and have a meal. Um, this is as they're getting a, a little bit bigger. Uh, they start green. This is sort of like that dancing one that I showed you earlier. Um, and it's getting a little bit bigger. There's one. There's another one. And this is as it gets bigger. These are from last year. These are a little bit older. Um, the, those very deep roots that produce all the heat, sending it up, are really beneficial because they are so deep. They stabilize the soil. They stabilize the stream beds and the 
Um, and that also filters the water. So the, the roots are very helpful for maintaining the stability of a particular area. Now, here's a little bit of an anatomy lesson for the skunk cabbage, but it's where all the things happen. This is that purple structure that I showed you before, but this is an inside look at it. This is called a spathe, spathe, or as I call it, a purple hoodie, hence I have purple on. So there's my purple hoodie and there's still some green and that's my pale green. So it's a protective thing. And it, at first that opening is closed. It grows and it's like a, a hood around it. And then the second thing, the spadix grows up inside of it. And that's a knob-like structure. And then all of these little things, 50 to 100, right at the tip, that's the flower. So each one of these space has one internal knob called a spadix, which then has these little flowers. And those little flowers produce the pollen. Now, if you look really closely, each one of the flowers has around it, you can probably see some lines, it has a four-part structure around it, each one of them. There's another one. You can see the lines. There's, an, there's one that's even better down here. When these get pollinated from another plant, they get pollinated, they then form a seed. So each one of these spadix has the potential of 50 to 100 seeds. Those little flowers are a quarter of an inch. They then get pollinated and over the next three-ish months, uh, really even a little bit longer, they will then form a seed. And those seeds can be, can be planted, but remember they're gonna have to be planted in wet, boggy water. So here's one that's opened up. See how it's purple and green? I love the colors. Um, this is its spadix in there. This is the, sp the spathe that is opened up, the purple hoodie, and this spadix. It, and that, when it starts to open, it has a really skunky smell. And that's where the pollinators say, oh, there's some food for me in there. And flies and beetles and um, like that smell of the rotting flesh, they go in there. They might sit on one of these uh, flower heads, which is coated with pollen. They might stay just to get some pollen, or they might stay overnight. Because remember, for about two weeks, this stays nice and warm and toasty. Bees frequently fly in, um, and they stay. They, they might have gone off for their hive for a long distance, come back. It's, it's sort of like a, an insect hotel motel um, that they can warm up overnight and then keep on flying. So it's a, a fascinating adaptive process. And here's one of those insects that's now all covered with pollen that can fly now to, to another place and then fertilize and, and pollinate um, another uh, space, spandex somewhere. Okay, now, here is um, a little bit later. This was March 16th this year. So just a, a few days ago. And now in Guernsey, all these are all the space that have come out. So rather than just that one little, oops, sorry. Rather than that one little beak that's beaking out, now we have bunches of them. See, here, here's one. And there's, there's also uh, buds that the leaves will be coming out of. There's one of the buds right there. And there's a spathe. Here's a green spathe. And here's one that's a little bit older, the spathe. See how they, they can twist. They have these amazing structural forms. And this is the leaf bud. And from that leaf is going to come that whole plant that will just in a spiral, spiral off leaves as it goes. 
Now, speaking of leaves, a plea for you in your yards, wherever you are, it's really dry. And um, especially in, in for plants that need wet root systems, the leaves prevent evaporation. Also in your yard, if you leave the leaves, under the leaves it are a lot of insects and other things that the birds and butterflies um, need for nutrients. If you get a leaf blower out there and blow off all your leaves, you're not gonna have this, as many birds or insects. So leave the leaves, especially around the plants on um, until at least uh, June or something like that. You're really harming the environment if you rake your leaves off or blow them off. Okay, now as the spathe grows, and here's the spathe again, here's the spadix inside, with the little tiny flowers, here is the leaf bud that's going to grow up alongside it. This nibble is probably a deer that uh, nibbled some of it uh, because it's young and tender and uh, that's probably what happened. Then it's going to grow into this and see how it unfurls as it goes along. It's sort of, some people say it's like a scroll that you unroll, but to me, you know how garbage bags come with one inside another, inside of another? To me, this is what it's like. They unfurl one leaf at a time, they separate and they go and separate. And the really amazing part of this is that there are little tiny ones underground, all ready for at least five seasons to come. And within each one of these plants, there is going to be this whole hierarchy of leaves for this year, next year, the following year. And each one of those segments has a node on it that develops into a spathe. So these are really interconnected kind of things. One spathe, but lots of leaves. And the leaves become about three feet by one foot. They're, they're huge leaves. And that's what it looks like, the colony of, of mature leaves. And remember, they're just uh, full of water. Uh, Guernsey has a place that looks like that. I didn't have a picture from it, so I'm using one from, from Minnesota in a wet, swampy area. Next year, I'll have a picture of it that I can add. And they just then disappear. But one thing I want to show you, I want to go back here. See, this is a, the spathe, remember? And a spathe is only about six inch, inches max. These guys get up to three feet. As the leaves start growing, the spathe starts shrinking and it's getting smaller and smaller. And pretty soon the leaf part of it, the outer protective hoodie is going to just dry up. The spathe, uh, the, the spadix will be there and they'll then all of those um, uh, seeds will start. Um, I'll show you a structure of it in just a minute. So that one, that one, and that's what the spadix looks like in each one of these in this really geometric, see it? Area, there's a seed. There's another seed. There's another seed. It has the potential for 50 to 100 seeds if the, uh, Insects have done, done their work. So that gives you the overview. So now we're gonna take you to the brook path. This is right by the high school. Um, I'm going to um, show you what that, that is like. Um, so there's the repeat of the map. We're going to um, think about what phases of growth do you think I would see in the brook path in late February, and then in mid-March. So we're going to go to the brook path and Michael's going to take you there. Go ahead, Michael. Now for the next search for the cabbage, I'm in the Wellesley High School parking lot. And if you turn around 180 degrees, there is Payne Street. And if you walk down Payne Street, at the end of the corner and turn right is going to be an entrance to the brook path. 
So we're going to go that way. I'm going to take you to a very easy place to see these skunk cabbages. I'm at the Payne Street entrance to Fuller Brook. So just come with me. We're just walking down the path. And you're going to come to a bridge down this winding path. Along the way, you're going to see this sort of boggy area. And you really can't get off the path but um, you're going to see skunk cabbage in there. You'll start seeing them. Um, it's pretty shady, so they'll probably come up late. But this whole area in here, all the way down to that bridge, even further, and then even on the left-hand side of the path. And I'm going to take you to two places. I'm standing on the boardwalk, and on the right um, are two clusters of them. One is growing through the snow, and one's down toward the water. I'm going to zoom in on them and see the one coming through the snow. And then there's a cluster down at the bottom. They are growing bigger by the minute, practically. Um, they're warming up. The sun is warming them up. And there's the skunk cabbage. Now we're going to turn to our left. We're going to go down the brook path. To the left and on your left is a lot of boggy water and skunk cabbage just loves boggy water so if you look down here you're going to start seeing some of it grow i'll stop and there's a few of them right there so if you're in an area that doesn't get very much sun this is going to be what they look like, say, uh, mid-March. When you come back here in mid-March, you're going to see them a lot larger and maybe even starting to leaf out. It's March 16th and I'm back on the brook path off Payne Street and they are really out now. So this is two weeks later. You can see the purple uh, forming, the leaves coming out. It's a very different, very active scene. Rather than just one or two, there's now lots of them, to the, especially to the right of the brook path. Again, March 16th on the book path near Payne Street. So look at them all. There's one. There's another cluster, there's another cluster over there. They're just all over the place, so one back further. So when you see this on the 24th, they should be growing quite well, and some are going to be in this stage. So what did it look like in February? Didn't it look like green beaks through the snow? Now, one of the things ab that about the early ones, these early, early ones, is that sometimes it's difficult to know whether it's the leaf bud that remains somewhere in the area or whether it's the new green space coming through. So when you're out early, um, I'm not good enough to be able to tell the difference, but I tried to check to see if I could find something that looked like a spathe that was going to be cracked right there. So that's why I thought it was. This one really has its internal combustion engine doing it. So that I, I thought that was, but um, um, a real naturalist can say, yep, that's the leaf bud, it's just there. Or these might be leaf buds, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. But you get the idea. Um, look for ones that are burning through the snow. And then when I went back on the, the 16th, did you see how different it was? How there, these ones are already purple. Here's the leaf bud that's going to then blossom out, coming through, not snow this time, but the leaves. And again, it's, it's really dry right now. And so the leaves has been protecting them uh, from moisture. I hope that we'll have a good season for skunk cabbages, but uh, 
the, the lack of water is a concern. So the, these are space that are growing in sunny spots. I call it the pretty, uh, the purple hoodie. Right now they're closed. And as I said, please leave the leaves in your yard too. The, the yard needs it. And then this is just this Monday. And this is at Guernsey, which is a much wetter area. This is our two hoodies that are now green purple. Um, you can probably sort of see that spadix in there. And this is the leaf bud. Here's another spathe. And here's another one with the leaf bud growing over here. So uh, Guernsey is, is really wet. Um, so you'll be able to see them. And they're so much fun. It's really fun to follow them over time and see how they transform themselves. Take a sketch pad, take some colored pencils and, and draw them. They're just amazing. Let me just end this with uh, some, some uses. Um, the, the Native Americans did use them as famine food. So it really was only when they really needed it. Sometimes they used it for seasoning. Uh, the root would be dried and ground sort of as flour. Uh, the leaves can be boiled but you have to really carefully prepare it, know what you're doing because they contain an awful lot of calcium oxalate can give you severe cramps and uh, in high concentrations to some sensitive people, they can even cause uh, rashes, irritation, perhaps even some blistering on your skin. So don't play around with it. Um, they, also, they also used it for, uh, for medical purposes. It, they used it to treat, um, headaches, nervous, and, and respiratory disease. Now, the pharmaceutical industry, where many of the uh, drugs that we used early in the 1800s, some even into the 1900s, were based on natural plant, plant products. There's even a natural, nat natural plant um, uh, society. And here's Clark Davis, which is, was a former pharmaceutical company based out of Detroit, it was selling the product skunk cabbage root. So it was then being used in the 1800s as a drug called, I love this name, draconium. Isn't that pretty, draconium, for the treatment of respiratory and mental illness. Skunk cabbage is really finding its way into research labs, into medical research labs uh, because of its heat present uh, production. Um, some research are looking at the mitochondrial diseases that also uh, are affected by heat production. And that uh, heat is coming out of mitochondria of the um, skunk cabbage. And this is the one that really is funny to me. In industrial use, some air conditioning companies are looking at it for a way to study its mechanism to make air conditioning more efficient in its use in energy. I think that's really bizarre that here is a plant that generates heat, that air conditioning, a German air conditioning company is investigating how to make its air conditioning more efficient. Well, how about wildlife? We know that deers are out there and they target early skunk cabbage. They eat the green leaves, just like they're eating all of our green leaves as they come out in our yards. In the summer, um, they eat the leaves also. They tend to leave that center stem, but uh, I don't know how they do it with all the calcium oxalate. But the funniest one is the sleeping bear. Now in the spring, you know, bears hi hibernate and they wake up. Now think about their, how they are processing food during all that time because they don't get up and eat. And they have a huge need to poop. And it's been reported, and I found it in a number of publications, that they eat the young leaves to unplug their GI systems so that they can then poop after their long naps. However, it, it's not just that function. Um, more recently, the newer research shows that in years where there aren't many acorns around, the, uh, the bears, about 90% of their diet is skunk cabbage because there's no acorns around. It's a high, it has protein in it. So they're, they're happy little bears. So uh, now you know why skunk cabbage is weird and wonderful. 
Uh, I really encourage you to go out and watch them change over time. As I said, try sketching them. Uh, they're amazing what, what they can do. Um, they uh, um, are colorful, they're artistic, they're scientific, uh, and they're our first wild native flower that blooms. And now you know what the flower looks like. It has no petal, but it does have a flower. So I want to thank uh, Michael for his tech, for his webinar support as we've gone through this, and also to Simon Gassenberg, Gassenberg who did a great job in edit, editing my clips. Thanks to both of you. And now, if you have any questions. Judy. Uh question I had right up front, and you addressed it a little bit, but when you come back to it, is skunk cabbage edible? Um, if you go to some of the, the sites uh, that are special for foragers, people that like to eat mushrooms and off the land, they say that it is, and they give you how they dig up the roots, which is pretty amazing because those roots go down forever. Some of them have been found to be over 100 years old. Uh, they live for at least, and they, they just, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. Um, and they say how they cook them and how they dry them, but I'd stay away from it. That calcium oxalate can really just wipe out your GI tract. You, you, you just don't want it. And some people that are really sensitive can have heart palpitations. Um, stay away from it. <laughs> Thank you. Don't want to be one of those hibernating bears waking up. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Thanks. That's all the questions that I see. I'm going to put in the chat box there some additional information where you can go right now um, and get information about uh, the Guernsey Sanctuary, how to find it, the two entrances to it, and the trails there. And the uh, you can see the spots that Judy showed. Bring your phone and uh, you'll be able to hit the 72 station QR code uh, trail that uh, was, was set up just a couple of years ago. And so, Judy, thanks for an amazing presentation. I had no idea. I've known about skunk cabbage, but nothing like that. Um, and so thank you. And also to Simon Glassenberg again uh, for the video editing for this. We'll be sending out a link to this recording and uh, the slides and uh, some of the links that we shared here today. Uh, within the next couple of days, we've got upcoming programs and most importantly, just get outside and enjoy this great weather and all the great trails and, and nature we have here in Wellesley. Thanks and have a great afternoon. <laughs>